Okay, so what I want to do today is I want to talk about how to read a book. It's probably your first book or your first longer text in Spanish or in the target language. I remember not too many moons ago being in the same position as you, and it was something that I found particularly daunting, especially coming at such an early period in time where you've had maybe a year of getting used to slightly longer texts, but still texts that aren't of the same length. These kind of look quite daunting. And there's different strategies that you need to deploy. So hopefully this little tutorial will give you a little bit of help on the strategies that you can use, etc. So the aims, what I want to do today is I want to look at the difference between macro level and micro level reading. There's different levels of reading, but these are the two that I want to focus on in particular. I want to look at the different ways in which we read, can read a text or read a piece of writing and look at strategies that you should deploy as good habits when reading the foreign text for the first time. So when we read anything, we read on different levels. When we read on the macro level, we're generally looking at the bigger picture or reading for the bigger picture. So you might read for social and historical context, or you might already have an awareness of that social and historical context, and that can frame the piece of information on the piece of text that you're reading. Also, the author's ideology might shine through. So for instance, if we know a bit about a certain author, say if we know about Sender being um, a, a one-point anarchist and one-point communist, we can read, for instance, Requiem Bordon Campus in Espanol and pull that apart. But we can only really do the, micro, the macro level reading if we've got the micro level down. And the micro level is often where we have to start, especially when we're looking at a foreign language novel or a text, because there's always gonna be pieces of vocabulary that we struggle with. The syntax is often different. And so these are things that we've got to consider. So the micro level, we're talking about smaller details. We're talking about can you piece together the words that are in front of you, the grammar that's in front of you, in order to make sense of the sentences that are in front of you before you start building up that general understanding, which can then lead to the macro level of reading. Now that micro level can often be quite challenging. It's very, very time consuming, as you'll see me do a paragraph in a second in a few seconds' time. Um, and it can get really, really frustrating and it can be somewhat time consuming, laborious, and it can feel like a right effort. But really what's important, and you've got to maintain this throughout to be really successful, especially reading um, literature, is to keep a really positive attitude towards it. And there'll be a few steps that I hope to show and hope to share with you that'll help you do that. So I want to talk about different ways of reading. Um, reading something that I'm generally quite interested in. Um, myself, I'm more of a non-fiction kind of person. I love reading newspapers, etc., um, articles online and blogs. Literature, I do enjoy. I do look, enjoy um, non-fiction. However, I've got to say I'm more of a non-fiction. I like reading facts. And the information that's in front of us and the different formats can lend themselves better to different styles of reading. If I want to get the general gist of something, I'd use a process that's called skimming. Skimming is where you read a piece of information. You're not necessarily paying attention to every single word, every single detail, but you just want to get the overall gist. Scanning, however, is where you scan through a piece of text and you want to find maybe a fact, a figure, quotation perhaps, that backs up something or answers a question directly, basically comprehension more or less. And so just literally lift it from the text. Extensive reading is where you read for pleasure. You read page after page after page in pursuit of maybe um, a good plot, a good narrative, a good piece of action. And it's often reading for pleasure. Well, it is reading for pleasure, more or less. And the last one is intensive. And this is where we're going to start, especially when we're looking at our first longer text in the foreign language. And it's where you have to read each sentence very, very carefully in order to build together understanding. Once you start doing intensive reading, and once your level of fluency and reading fluency builds up, arguably you can extend to the extensive reading and start reading for pleasure and narration and action. Or even a couple of reads intensively can lead to that. Now, I've put on the side that skim and scanning and extensive reading are generally top-down readings. This is where you can use context to predict your outcome. For instance, if we've got a bus timetable, it might give you the route of where the bus goes, and that'll give you some numbers of the times that it goes. You know the time that you want to go, you know what you need to look for, and that's going to aid you in that process of scanning. And it's using that context, it's using 
um, the fact that you want to go to 12 o'clock to find the right solution and the, find the right time. Intensive reading, however, is generally what you call bottom up. And this is where you have to build up meaning from individual words and sounds, eventually building up the sentences, which builds up in the paragraphs. So that's the difference between top down and bottom up reading. Now, like I said, read intensively is going to be something that you need to do when you're engaging with the foreign text, because our literacy levels aren't as strong in the foreign language as they are in English. So these are my tips. Use short, focused bursts. What you'll find is you'll find yourself going from wordreference.com to the actual book, to then maybe a vocabulary book, to maybe a knowledge organizer. You're going to be cross-referencing several different things. And when you're focused in that in that mode in that zone what can often happen is you can find yourself getting quite fatigued quite quickly so if you use short focus bursts of maybe half an hour or less maybe 20 minutes and then give yourself a five minute break or so you're going to be able to reset yourself and the same comes when you're revising it's one of those strategies you know yourself you've revised for gcse exams after about 30, 40 minutes, perhaps your attention span goes and you need that reset. So use those short focus bursts and apply that strategy for when you're reading. Use wordreference.com and the RAI to look up vocabulary. The reason why I'm saying using these is because if you use google.com, you're never gonna find, or you're gonna find it harder to find the infinitive. And if you've got an infinitive, you can take that infinitive, you can manipulate it with your knowledge of grammar, and basically increase your, your active vocabulary, which is, which is what you want. You want that active vocabulary in the foreign language. Annotate vocabulary in the text. Now, this sounds silly, but if you annotate it in the text, then you're gonna be able to, if you reread it, just have a quick look underneath. You've already done the hard work, you've put the effort in so you can read it a bit easier the second time around. And this might sound really laborious, but record that vocabulary in a vocabulary book. The reason why I'm saying doing that is because you're building yourself your own little revision guide of key vocab. You can test yourself on that key vocabulary and ultimately commit to memory. Make notes about it as well. You'll have more space in that vocabulary book than you will, on the, will have in the text. Now, if you're putting that much time into decoding maybe one or two sentences for understanding, you're probably going to forget um, what's actually going on about the plot, the characters and the narrative. So just always take the time just in the margin to write down notes in English on what's happened maybe in the paragraph, every other paragraph, as you go. So if you have to put things down, which you will put tools down, you're not going to read it in one night. You can come back and just have a quick look at the note where you left off and pick up from there. It's going to make your life easier. And after you've read a few paragraphs, just take the time to sum up what you've read. Maybe keep your own little summary or again, just jot it down the bottom of the book. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this um, section of Requiem. I'm just going to look at the first paragraph and I'm going to show you how I would go about annotating it. If you're doing French, German, whatever else, just follow the systems that I'm using. It doesn't matter that you don't understand it. So I'm going to start off El Cura. I'm not sure what El Cura is, so I'm going to underline that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little arrow there. El Cura, I put in a word reference and it comes up as cure, addressing, treatment, medical care doesn't quite make sense if I'm talking about requiem mass, does it? So if I look a bit further down, it comes up with priest or pastor. This is the one that we want. So I'm going to put priest underneath it. When I'm looking at this as well, I'm noticing cura ends in an A. And as teachers, you're often told that most nouns that end in an A are feminine. I'm noticing here it's not. So that's something that when you add it to your vocabulary book, I would make a note of, make a really conscious effort to learn. Esperaba sentado en un sillón con la cabeza inclinada sobre la casulla. I'm not sure what la casulla is, so I'm going to underline that. Follow the same process, draw my little arrow. Casulla comes up with chasuble in the on word reference. Now, I don't know what one is. So again, this is where the, this intensive reading process comes into play. You have to look at what the actual English word means. Sometimes in word reference, you'll get an extra little bit of clue in the brackets. And the extra little bit of clue that we've got is that it's a religious um, vestment or a religious piece of dress. So I would put that. It's not essential that I know what one is intrinsically. Dress. So I've just annotated that. De los oficios de requiem. La sacristía olía a incienso. Now this olía, I'm not sure what it is. When I'm looking at olía, there's certain things about that word that I'm noticing. 
I'm noticing straight away that it ends in IA. For those of you who are hispanists, you'll know that IA is often a marker of the imperfect tense. I haven't got my infinitive there, so I know it's got to be the imperfect tense. Plus, if we look further back earlier on, we've got esperaba, which is also in the imperfect tense. So it's most likely going to be the imperfect tense that it's going to be here. So, if I put olia, a conjugated verb, into word reference, the likelihood is I'm not going to get anything come up. What I need to do is I need to work back to try and find the infinitive of olia. Now, olia ends in ie for the imperfect tense. For verbs in the imperfect tense that I take ie as the ending, as the marker, I know that either er verbs or ir verbs. So what I would do is I would Google olive and olia and see which one comes up and which one makes sense if both come up. What you'll find come up will be oler, and oler itself means to smell. So I'm going to put, to aid my reading, rather than putting the infinitive here, I'm going to put smell. But again, when I'm writing my vocab list the, in the booklet, for my vocabulary book, I would put olia, it smelled, oler to smell, so you've got that infinitive there. En un rincón había un fajo. I'm not sure what un fajo is, so again, I'm going to underline it. A little arrow, and it'll tell me that it means a bunch. It's like a bunch or a um, bundle. De ramitas de olivo. Ramitas, branches. De olivo. De las que habían sobrado del domingo de Ramos. Now again, I'm not sure what sobrado is, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to underline sobrado. What I've got in front of sobrado is I've got avian, which forms part of the pluperfect tense. So again, I'm going to have to look for my infinitive. If I looked up the infinitive of avian to get haber, I would just get to have. That doesn't make sense with East, uh, with Palm Sunday. So what I need to do is I need to look up the actual sobrado part of the verb, which is the past participle technically. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to work back from that past participle to find my infinitive. So sobrado, that a though is quite nice because it tells me it's an ER verb. I'll put sobrar into wordreference.com and it'll tell me to be left over. So in this case, had been left. But again, in my notebook, in my vocabulary book, I would put sobrar to be left over. Keep on reading. Las hojas estaban muy secas y parecían de metal. Al pasar cerca, Mosemillán evitaba rozarlas porque se desprendían y caían al suelo. Rozar. I'm not sure what rozar is, so again, I'm going to look that up. It's the brush against. Porque se desprendían y caían al suelo. Now, suelo, you've got to be careful with. Doesn't mean usually in this case, it means on the floor. So, I've just gone through there, quickly read through that, looked up those different words that I'm not sure of. So, what I've done after reading, I'm going to make a few quick notes to myself here. And I would do these on the sides. We've done annotation in the text it's also important to put it into your vocabulary book so here's an example of something that i give to my students where you've got a column for spanish that you'll find in the dictionary and in the text itself you've got the english translation the infinitive and any notes so an inf an example of what i might put in here for instance we met el cura which reserved meant priest now for my noun i can't get an infinitive from that so that's fine i'll skip that bit but notes i might want to put um, masculine noun. If I've got another verb, I might put by the one. I return. I'll put my infinitive in there, and again, I'll just denote that change. Well, so that's just how I would go about using that vocabulary list. So the main things when you're reading the book: one, make sure you annotate the text as you go. 
two, make sure you put it in a vocabulary book so you've got it all there and you can come back to it as you go. Third thing, don't spend too long in one burst. You want to give yourself short, snappy bursts and make sure you don't become disillusioned with it and keep a positive attitude. Sum up what you've read after each paragraph, sum up what you've read after each page perhaps and keep it short. Once you've read it once, go back and read it again and you'll read it a lot quicker the second time. 